Hello, my name is uh, Reverend Tom Hooker, and I'm the pastor here at Summit United Methodist Church. And on behalf of uh, our music director, Rhonda Berlin, and our assistant pastor, Reverend Connie Hooker, and our technical crew, um, Cheryl Martucci and Audrey MacArthur, uh, we are so glad that you're here, and we welcome all of you, whether you're here in person or online. And uh, uh, you may have no if you're online, you may have noted that um, we started online a little bit early, um, about three or four minutes before we act, uh, Rhonda actually started playing. Um, and I just uh, uh, applaud our, our tech crew, um, Cheryl and Audrey, who are doing this uh, on their own for the first time. And um, this, this just is a great example of what I'm going to be talking about, is that we need to step out and, and do some new things. And so I applaud them for, um, for setting this up and, and getting us uh, on video and, and, and helping us to be live on Facebook. So if you're watching online, um, give your thanks to them for, for making this happen. Uh, today we're going to be talk, continuing our conversation about called to be the church and we're talking about the fact that we are called to be the church in a multicultural world. Uh, we come together with open hearts to worship the risen Christ. He has entered into our lives in unexpected ways and calls us to follow. At times, this interferes with our private lives and may make us uncomfortable. Yet we are assured that Christ goes before us and walks alongside of us. This journey begins with giving our full attention to him. Let us then worship. It's only through your mercy. 
Good morning. Please join me in the centering prayer. Lord God, as we worship you this day, we ask that you stir us out of complacency, renew and transform us to be open and willing to participate in all kinds of ministry with people from all places and all walks of life. Break down the barriers we have put in place and move us into action to share your love. Open our hearts and calm our doubts. Teach us to follow where Christ leads. Amen. It is now time for our children's message. And so if you're uh, watching online, um, I invite you to get, gather the children around um, to, to watch this children's message. And if you're here in person, I call your attention to this children's message. And remember, we are all children of God. So, who likes M&Ms? Raise your hands. Yeah, I love M&Ms. And I have a bag of M&Ms here, just to remind us. But do you ever notice something about M&Ms? You can't really see it real well in the picture here, but I brought some M&Ms. I don't know if you can see this on the camera. But what do you notice about these M&Ms? They're all different colors, right? Yeah. I have a yellow one in here and a green one and an orange one and blue and red and brown. Do you have a favorite color? Yeah, what's your favorite color? Green. Yeah, I like the greens too. Okay. But what about inside? What's inside of an m &M? That's just a candy shell. What's inside? Chocolate. Now, so does that mean there is blue chocolate inside the blue m and and green chocolate inside the green m and What do you think? Well, let's, let's test it. Let's see. Okay. Now, I should give you a warning, children. Don't do this at home. <laughs> Have an adult do it for you, okay? We're going to open up an M&M and see what's inside and see if this blue M&M has blue chocolate in it. So I'm going to attempt to cut it in half. Okay, let's see. No, it's not blue. I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but it's brown. That's what chocolate's supposed to be, right? Well, you also have white chocolate, I guess. Okay, well, let's try another one. Let's see if this yellow one has yellow chocolate in it. Nope. See this, but this is brown as well. Let's try one more. How about the green one? You think the green one has green chocolate? You think? All right. Let's try it. Guess what? It's brown. So, even though they all look different on the outside, they're all different colors on the outside. And they also come in different sizes, too. You can have mini M&Ms. They're really small. And they're all made in different places. But they're all the same inside. Now, what do you suppose that I'm, the, the point is that I'm trying to make here? It's like people. We all look different. We're all from different places. Some of us speak different languages. We're all born in different places. 
were different colors. But guess what? On the inside, we're the same. In God's eyes, we're all the same. No matter who we are, no matter where we are from. And the, the Bible passage that Pastor Connie is going to read for us in a few moments tells us a story about one of the apostles named Peter. And he has this dream. They call it a vision. It's a dream where he is taught that God sees everyone the same. To God, all of us are the same. And that's the way we ought to look at other people, that they are the same as we are. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the fact that we may all look different and we may all be from different places, but yet we are the same. And in your eyes, we are all equal, no matter who we are and where we are from. So help us to see each other in that same way. Help us to see each other the way that you see us and help us to treat each other in that same way so that your love may be spread throughout the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. This morning's scripture is taken from the book of Acts, verses, chapter 10, verses 44 to 48, and chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Listen for the word of the Lord for you today. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a sh large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, 
you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to him, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I begin to speak, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had been upon us at the beginning. Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In my family of origin, we have quite a bit of experience in a multicultural environment. Many of you may remember and may know that I was born in the Netherlands to Dutch parents who themselves grew up most of their childhood in Indonesia. And when I was two years old, my dad, for his job with the Arabian um, American Oil Company, was given a project that took him to Iraq. Now, this was in the 1950s. And so my mom and I went with him, and we lived in Iraq for two years. And then we returned to the Netherlands. But at the age of five, my dad's new job with Alcoa, with a subsidiary of Alcoa, took him and our family to a country named Suriname. Now, Suriname is a small country um, on the northern part of South America. It was formerly a Dutch colony. And Alcoa had some uh, large operations there. And so we moved to Suriname, and we lived there for five years. And at the age of 10, we immigrated to the United States to the Pittsburgh area. Now, in every one of these cases, every move that we make made to another country was quite a disruption in our family lives as we knew it. It caused us to make some adaptive changes. And it was a challenge, I'm sure. When um, I was, now I don't remember a lot of the, you know, the time that um, when we moved, when I was preschool, like when we moved to Iraq, I don't remember a whole lot. I don't remember that. I, I only know that from the stories that my mom tells me and photographs. But I do remember the moves to Suriname and to the United States. And I remember the changes that had to be made. I'm sure it wasn't easy for my parents, but yet they made the changes. They faced the adaptive challenges head on. For me, there were also changes that needed to take place. Changes with school, with language, with friends, with play. When we first moved to Suriname, I, I uh, attended the first and second grade in a Dutch school. Now, Suriname, you have to understand, is at that time was a, was a um, 
was a very, um, very much a multicultural environment. There was quite a mix of cultures in Suriname. And so was the school that I attended in first and second grade. But when I was eight years old, my parents knew that in two years, they were going to be immigrating to the United States. And so they put me in the American school there. But I didn't speak English yet. So imagine that adaptive challenge. But with my parents' help, I got through that. And then at the age of 10, when we moved to the United States, it was another set of adaptive challenges for all of us. And the challenge when you move to a multicultural environment, as it was in our case, is you have to make the changes, but at the same time, you want to remain true to who you are. And thanks to my mom's insistence, she always kept our Dutch heritage and our Dutch language right in front of us at home, knowing that we had to adapt when we left the boundaries of our household. And so when we moved to the United States, I had to learn things that I didn't know. I had to learn a different way of, of being in school than I was in Suriname. In Suriname, the American school was really a small school. It was a run, uh, many cases, there were two or three classes in one room and one teacher. But I also had to learn, I had to learn how to get along in the uh, on the playground. I didn't know the games. I didn't know how to play baseball or football or kickball. I had to learn all those things. Fortunately, there were some kids um, who, who were very uh, much supportive and, and helped me out. And my dad, well, my dad and I learned about baseball and football together. So we had to learn to adapt. Now, I share this with you because I think the church is constantly in a time that it needs to be able to adapt and adapt to the culture. You know, the church is not the same. The world around us is constantly changing, and, and the world is not the same as it was when this congregation was first established or when this building was built. In fact, the world is not even the same when I first came here eight years ago. We need to be adapting to the culture. That doesn't mean we change who we are, but it does mean we need to make some changes. If we are to share the message, if we are to share the good news, and if we are to be relevant in our communities, much like the first century church. They had to constantly adapt to be relevant. If they hadn't, we probably wouldn't be here as a church today. So they had to constantly open themselves to new points of view. Here they were and they were thinking that, you know, what God has done in and through Christ was just for them, the Jewish people. Surprise, God was on the move and God was doing a new thing and they had to allow themselves to be open to that. What new thing is God doing that we need to open ourselves up to? So Peter, as the, the text uh, that Connie read for you, Peter, is in the home of Cornelius, a non-Jewish person, much like the account that we read about uh, with Philip and the Ethiopian. And he's, he's in the home of this Gentile, and this Gentile has other people in his household, and Peter is sharing the good news. And the whole household is converted and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that seems strange. I think Peter's mind was just blown by that. 
as, as was the case for his companions who traveled with him. This, this isn't how they perceive things to be. Gentiles being saved, being filled with the Spirit like they were at, on Pentecost. No, that can't happen. But indeed it did. In chapter 10, leading up to where Connie started reading in, in verse 44, all the verses leading up to that are the account of Peter's vision that he has. And then he repeats that he, he, in, chapter, in the beginning of chapter 11. He finds himself back in Jerusalem defending what he did with Cornelius and his household, defending what he did to the other apostles and other disciples in Jerusalem because they were criticizing him for it. And so he, re he, he summarizes this vision he experienced. So one of the things I noted was that here we have this account of Peter's vision two times, almost two times in a row, back to back, in chapter 10 and chapter 11. And I think that points to how important it was to the author, Luke, to let us know what God was up to. To let us know how important it is to be a witness in a multicultural world. Now, when Peter summarizes this vision um, about these foods that are unclean, it's really not about the foods. It's not about dietary laws. It's more about people. It's about people because God does not make a distinction among people. You know, I often say, well, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, we, uh, we accept people who are not like us. But when we make distinctions among people, that's really a, a human-made thing. We define distinctions. God doesn't. God looks at us, at us all as equal, as children. Now, Peter doesn't understand this at first, but he's a believer. He's a follower of the way of Christ. And so he listens to the prompting and he goes ahead and travels to the house of Cornelius. You see, Peter opens himself up to new possibilities. Even though he doesn't understand them yet, he allows himself to be open. He lets go of his presumptions. And it's not just about the conversion of these Gentiles. It's about the transformation of Peter and his companions when they now see what God is doing, what God is up to. And they now see that they need to go outside of their boundaries to share the good news. God was intruding in Peter's life. There's no mistake about that. As God so often does in our lives. It's unexpected. But when those intrusions come, we learn from Peter that we need to open our hearts and our minds to the new possibilities that God has in store for each of us and for us as a congregation. You know, most of us, we, we live in this, this environment. We're all pretty, um, pretty much the same. But that should not isolate us from the multicultural environment that's the world out there. We need to be open. We need to accept and embrace these new possibilities and embrace and be out in that multicultural world sharing the good news, sharing God's love. You know, just because we have accepted Christ in our lives does not mean we are finished. That's just the beginning. And just because we have established a congregation here does not mean we're done. It's the beginning. 
And just because we're here to worship, whether it's in person or online, it does not mean we're done for the week. It's the beginning. And it should motivate us to go out there and be a part of that multicultural world, sharing God's love in any way that we can, in all that we say and in all that we do. The reformer Martin Luther once said that you are baptized once, but it takes a whole lifetime to complete it. So the church is ripe for renewal, I think. You know, we're, we're in this multicultural world now. We're, we're approaching a post-pandemic world, hopefully. And we're ripe for change. We're ripe for renewal. We need to listen and we need to let go of our own assumptions. We need to be willing to take risks and make the changes that are necessary we need to get out into that world, that multicultural world, because it is part of our mission. When we do that, we have a better ability to understand the mission, to respond to God's new possibilities. We can't be a community that's complacent. We need to be a community that's willing to meet people where they are and willing to go out and meet people. Do you notice that Peter didn't wait for Cornelius to come to him. He went to Cornelius. He went to the Gentile. So we need to make those adaptations in our lives. You know, change is disruptive, but it can also be po very positive. Think about major changes that have happened throughout history. Think of recent history, for example, technology, with the personal computer and smartphones. At first, they were sort of disruptive to their industries. Nobody really knew what to make of it and whether they were going to take off or not. But now they're a part of our everyday lives. And that's what happens to these disruptive changes that we are called to. At first, they are very uncomfortable. But then, the more we work with it, the more we allow ourselves to adapt, the more they become part of who we are. You know, my family, when we first came into the United States, it was awkward. But in time, and it didn't take that long because we had to live and breathe this new culture. It became, it became a part of us. We don't even think about it anymore. The church needs to accept change. The church in general it has a history of, of having a hard time with that. But we need to accept God's intrusion because God is doing a new thing among us. I'm sure of that. I don't know what it is yet, but I am sure of it. God is doing something new right here in this congregation. You see, it's not about our programs. It's about God's mission. That's what this is all about. It's not about us. It's about God. You know, in the past, this church has made some adaptive changes. Think of, you know, years ago when you first decided to, to bring in a daycare center. You brought in a daycare center, and then later you brought in the Y daycare and preschool. I'm sure at first that was very disruptive, those changes. But now, they are a part of us. And hundreds, maybe even thousands of children and families' lives have been Im impacted by that. Some who may not have any other church connection. That was an adaptive change. And think about some of your mission experiences. 
from local mission experiences such as the backpack program and ramps of hope and, and, and working with EUMA or your global missions, the mission trips that we've gone on from the Appalachia Service Project to one by one to Jamaica. The first time we did those, yes, they were uncomfortable. They were disruptions. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was going to happen and how we were going to be able to respond. But in time, as we continued to immerse ourselves in those experiences, they became a part of us. But we're not done. We can't be complacent and we can't rest in those experiences because, again, God is doing something new among us. I know we're not a diverse community. We're all pretty much the same. But that's no excuse. We can't isolate ourselves from the world. We need to be out there in the world. We need to be attentive to what God is up to and be able to let go of our own assumptions and then be open and listen and make the changes, allow ourselves to be transformed. Disruptions are difficult. They can be unsettling. And then they become the norm. But they only become the norm because we were willing to step out of the boat and do something new. You know, when Peter made, <clears throat> excuse me, when Peter made this report to, his, uh, to the, his fellow apostles and other disciples in Jerusalem, <clears throat> there was a lot of resistance and criticism for what he was doing. They were really grilling him. Why did you do this? This is so contrary to our Jewish law. Peter gave his summary, and then he asked a question that silenced his critics. You remember what the question was? If God gave them this same gift, and I paraphrase, if God gave them the same gift that he gave us, then who was I that I could hinder God? Great question. Who are we? Who are we here at Summit United Methodist Church to hinder God, to stand in the way, to stand in the way of the new thing that God is doing among us? Who are we to resist what God wants us to do? To resist the spiritual driven disruptions. Who are we to resist that? Who are we to say no to God? After all, it is about God. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, we praise you and love you. We come together to worship you and bless your holy name. For you are Abba, Father, Lord, Mighty, and you love us so very much. Thank you for loving us so much that you sacrificed your only son, Jesus Christ, for us, as sinners though we are. Lord, we thank you for the teaching and healing done by Jesus Christ while he walked the same earth that we walk. We thank you that he gave love, peace, joy for everyone and did so with gentleness, kindness, and humility. We are grateful that Jesus still walks with us through the power of the Holy Spirit and holds us firmly in his arms. We are beloved children of yours, God. Lord, we pray for those who are ill, 
especially with COVID, and suffer terribly. We pray for those in India who are consumed with illness, death, and grief. We pray for all who mourn this day and for those who feel broken, lonely, alone, and desperate. May we reach out to others so that they may know your love deeply. Help us to help others and to see everyone with equity and love. Help us, Lord, to change systems which oppress others, especially when this is found in the church. We pray with all of our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning, I want to tell you about three ways that you can respond uh, to um, this morning's message and what God might be calling us all to. Uh, first, you know, um, again, uh, we've, the last couple of weeks, we have been taking these offering cards. There are, um, they are in the back of the, or at the entry exits to the sanctuary, where you uh, just write how you are offering yourself to God and how you are offering yourself to work with and in this congregation to do God's work. And so I encourage you to fill these out. These are the ones I have received thus far. And um, <clears throat> we'll have another week of, of collecting these. So I hope if you haven't filled one of these out yet that you will do so. Second, uh, another way to get involved, you know, I talked about being in a multicultural world. Well, we are going to have an opportunity um, thanks to uh, uh, someone in the nominations uh, committee. Uh, you may recall that in February, we usually have a visioning day. Well, obviously we had to postpone that this year. And so we have rescheduled that for June 12th and that to be outside. It's an all church visioning day. And uh, we have invited someone from our nominations committee has invited uh, a person and his family uh, who are immigrants to the United States uh, from Nepal. And they are going to share their story, an inspirational story with us of how they came here to Erie and how they uh, built up a business. And so I encourage you to save that date of June 12th for this uh, congregation-wide, and we hope it to be community-wide uh, visioning event where we will hear the story of this immigrant family. 
Um, and then, of course, another way that we respond to God is through our tithes and offerings. Our tithes and offerings help to make changes in the world. They help to make events such as our visioning day possible. And so our tithes and offerings are a way in which we can respond to how God is calling us uh, to be in a multicultural world. And we can present those tithes and offerings through either electronic means, which is our church app or church website, or we can mail them into the church office or deposit them in the offering plates that are located at the entry exit to uh, this worship space. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and ever-loving God, we do thank you for all the gifts that you have blessed us with, for the ways in which we can respond to you. And so as we offer ourselves and our financial resources to you, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you, we just pray, O oh God, that you might use them to bless your world and to make you known. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us uh, online or in person uh, this morning. And I want to, again, give a special thanks to Cheryl and Audrey uh, for <clears throat> uh, stepping in and uh, helping us, <clears throat> excuse me, helping us to be live on Facebook um, <clears throat> this morning. And um, I hope you'll join us next week as we continue our discussion of Call to Be Church, we're going to be talking about leadership in the church. And you can join us next week, either in person at 8.15 or 9.30, or you can watch us live at 8.15 or anytime thereafter on Facebook or YouTube or our church app. And now remember that we never leave a place of worship but instead we are sent out into the world to be and do for others what Jesus Christ has been and done for us. Let us go and do so now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.